Welcome back to another episode of the Pumped On Property Show, everybody. We have our warm cups of tea this morning because even the Sunshine Coast is freezing this morning, <laughs> isn't it, bro? It's icy. Absolutely icy. Really looking forward to getting into today's podcast where we are talking about the holy grail of property investing. And what we're going to get into is just the property investment goals that myself and Ben really focus on as residential property investors. Without a doubt, you know, for me, as I've learned more as an investor, I've talked to more people over the years, I'm always looking for capital growth, cash flow. I'm looking for timing. Even though people say you can't time markets, you can certainly make better decisions than the average. And um, something that I can sink my teeth into and add a little bit of value as well. So we're going to sort of talk through these, our own experiences, the experiences of some of our clients and really break it down. Now, I know that's asking for a lot, but you know, if you've only got a small amount of money like we both have and you're only going to do a small number of properties over a lifetime, you really want to make sure you nail every single one of them. And we know that that's the reality of property investing as well. I think we looked into the statistics and I can't remember the exact numbers, but you know, obviously in Australia, you've got 30% of properties that are owned by investors, um, but that 30% of properties is actually owned by 20% of Australians. And then when you look at the split of Australians that actually own more than two investment properties, it's less than 4% of those investors. So Mm. it is extraordinarily rare for you to have a large portfolio. And we all know this, it gets so hard to buy more properties as your journey goes on. So this is why it's so important to make sure that you nail every single one of your properties. If you're only gonna buy maybe two investment properties over your whole life, then they need to be the best and you can't cut any corners, you can't, you know, make any sacrifices or concessions. You really want to make sure that you tick every single one of these boxes throughout the journey of your property investment um, portfolio. hundred percent. Like I, um, I haven't ticked all of these boxes on many of the properties I've bought personally, you know what I mean? Like I, And this is the beautiful thing, like regardless of you ticking all of these boxes or even wanting to, the market is very, very forgiving over a 15 to 25 or 30 year period of time. For me though, um, about five years ago, I decided that I really, really wanted financial freedom early in my life personally. I want not just freedom through equity or from having a wealthy position, but I want cash flow coming in while I'm asleep that means I never have to work again in my 40s if I don't want to. And so I'm getting closer and closer to that point and so is Simon and so are many of our clients. But it is a journey. It's not going to happen before I'm 40, unfortunately. But, you know, I've also learned that it doesn't need to happen straight away either. Yeah, and you can focus on some of the other things throughout that process. For example, my property hasn't really generated any... Ca- my portfolio hasn't generated any cash flow yet, but it's given me good... I've timed the markets well, I've gotten decent capital growth, I've got some ability to manufacture some value and then the cash flow will come. So it's not like you need to have every single one of these today, it's making sure that by the time you have executed your investment strategy, they are providing you with what you want them to. And cash is king, right? Like property is a lot to transact with your entry and exit costs, you know, stamp duty fees, with um, real estate agent fees and, and the time it takes to find a seller and everything like that, it's it's a lot. So I don't want to have to constantly be selling properties in the future. I just want to live off the rental income from the properties. And I think that it's a, a, a common occurrence for a lot of people that we talk with as well. So let's sort of, you know, talk firstly about capital growth. Um, the things that I know based on the history from CoreLogic and Phil Anderson is that Houses have outperformed units significantly in Australia over the last 25 years. The metro markets have consistently outperformed the average regional market. Now, what's weird about data is averages aren't outliers. And so actually the top 25 markets in Australia in the last 25 years have been the regional markets, the yeah. Byrons, the Gold Coast, the Sunny Coast, the um, you know whatever else, the Geelongs, the Mornington Peninsulas. But... The average, and where I've got to with this, if there's only a handful of capital cities that I'd buy, in fact, three of them on the East Coast personally, then 
I can get my head around three markets versus 50,000 individual suburbs in Australia and other regional markets. And that's the reason I've chose Metro personally. Yeah, well, when you think about some of the things that put pressure on property prices, we know the power's in the land, certainly. Like the land is what's going to go up in value, not what's sitting on top of it. So you want to control as much of the land as you possibly can or whatever you can afford. Uh, We know that the more people, the more demand there's going to be in that area as well. And, and that's, you see it in Sydney, the biggest capital city in Australia, highest median house price in Australia, second most populated region of Australia, Melbourne, second highest property prices in the metro markets. So it, it really helps you understand the things that are going to put more pressure. And then you want to look at the jobs that these people are doing, you know, how much money are they earning? Do they have enough money to service the loans, service the, the debt on their properties? And then you're also looking at the infrastructure. It's like, well, what does the government want to put into this region? Uh, do they expect more people to come into this area and they're building the roads, the train stations, the hospitals, universities, shopping centres, the buildings to support this population growth? And all of that stuff brings value, it brings jobs, and it, and it increases the uh I guess, popularity of that area, you know, you think about North Brisbane, right, where we've been buying three, four years ago around the new Petrie University, that region before that uni opened up was a pretty under the radar place. But then this university gets announced, the train station upgrades gets gets announced, and then all of a sudden, there's a lot of pressure in that area. 100%, man. Like I am... Um I think in terms of targeting capital growth, it's quite simple. Like it's the big rocks and then it's going, as you said, like following the infrastructure train now in terms of where the infrastructure is going, it's going where the population is going. 75% of Australia's population growth in the future is going to end up in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. The ABS says that Sydney and Melbourne will be cities of 10 million people each within 25 years and Brisbane will be the exact size of Sydney today in 22 years according to the ABS. And then if you look at the infrastructure that occurred in Sydney around the Olympic Games, um, that same sort of infrastructure, underground rail, heavy rail, light rail, trams, um, there's just so much coming into South East Queensland at the moment, as well as the affordability side of things. And so you've got this wave of people coming up and then this wave of jobs and infrastructure. And you couple that with inflation. Um, this is one of the things that we don't talk about too much, but in terms of capital gains, people right now globally are looking for a hedge against inflation. Mm. And if you look at hundreds of years worth of inflationary data, or particularly the last 60, we see that property does extremely well as a hedge. There's other asset classes that do extremely well too, but at some point, people are going to be looking for real returns and leverage and property is a great way for that money to start coming back into the market. So I think capital growth wise on top of that, you know, I want the best pocket of the city. Mm. I want the best suburb in that pocket of the city. For example, eastern side of Melbourne, Mm. um, maybe northern side of Perth or eastern side of Perth. Um, Definitely like central Brisbane, eastern, south or north Brisbane. Um, And it's, you know, every single market in Australia has got its own spot. And then once we get to the suburb level, the best street, the quietest street, the biggest piece of land and that quality home, like all of these things add to the capital growth story. Mm. And it doesn't have to be any more complicated than Brisbane, southeastern beaches, big block, quiet street, big home. And Mm. it's like you can take all of this idea of growth and you can use history to define, you know, your future. And that's really comforting to know that it, you can just simplify it that easily. You know, you go from, I read yesterday, there's 15,000 suburbs throughout Australia and it's like, you know, just refining it down to three markets. Like you look at what the smartest investors, the most experienced investors and what they do on average. And it's like they invest in Melbourne, Geelong, Mornington Peninsula, Sydney, Wollongong, Newcastle, Brisbane, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, you know, they're consistently investing into these areas because they have outperformed over the longer term in terms of capital growth. And then when you get into those specific markets, you can really start to pick the eyes out of it to try and generate a little bit of a better return. I know so many investors make the mistake of trying to save money on the way in. They try and keep a little bit of money in their pocket on the way in, and this costs them significant money down the line. And by 
analyzing the market, identifying the better pockets of the market, identifying the better suburbs within that pocket, the better pockets within that suburb and the better properties within that, sub, that pocket of the suburb as well. All of these things are putting you in a position where you're mitigating the, the downside risks and obviously putting yourself in a position where you're trying to generate the best return on your investment because at the end of the day, as investors, that's all we're trying to do is get the best return on our investment over the long term. You know, I think an awesome example of this that you and I played around with a lot a few years ago is if you go and buy a million dollar property today and, you know, you just pick it up anywhere in Australia and you average a 4% return over the next 15 years versus really applying some of the simple things that we've talked about today based on history and you get a 6% return instead, your position over 15 years on a million dollars where we look at the returns, and in both instances, you're gonna be in a great position. Yeah. But the 6% return puts you about $550,000 better off. So this is why these days, when I'm thinking about buying, I'm not just rushing in and grabbing something. I'm looking at all of the things that Simon and I have just mentioned, and that's why we work with such a small number of people each month, because there's, Brisbane's a big city, like mm. Sunshine Coast is a big area, but when you apply the things that we apply, there is fuck all really, really, really good property. And the people that, you know, that aren't listening to this stuff are just, you know, they're the beautiful people that are going to sort of pick up everything around your properties and drive the market up. And mm. the rising tide will lift all boats. But it's when that water drains, I want to make sure I've got the right assets in the right locations with the right incomes, the right vacancy rates, and I'm protected in good or you know bad weather days. Yeah, and we've just recorded a how-to series on our YouTube channel um, where we talk about <coughs> how to identify the right market, how to identify the right suburb, how to identify the right property, and even how to negotiate that deal when you get there as well. And all of those things will help frame, will help you understand the fundamentals that we've learned from buying over $300 million worth of real estate. So capital growth is a must have for us. No, a lot of people are willing to sacrifice it for cash flow, uh, but at the same time, you know, capital growth is quite easy to attain if you can implement these fundamentals and if you can understand, you know, where to be purchasing those properties and when. But cash is certainly king. You know, cash is what's going to give us choices in the future. Cash is what's going to give us freedom. Cash is what's going to enable us to generate that passive income, to enable us to do the things that we want. So you have to be able to incorporate a balanced strategy where it may not be immediately that you're going to get that cash flow, but you certainly want to make sure that that property will constantly be rented out over the longer term and will also provide you with a good passive income by the time you own it outright or by the time you are getting closer to uh, the end of your investment journey. You know, I was catching up with an accountant the other day and we are talking about future scenarios for myself and my wife, Lisa, and... He said, Ben, I sort of see three or four different options for you. And these are the sort of three or four different options that most investors have. Now, the first option is you own assets now, you hold them for 10, 15 years, or you hold them till retirement, and then you sell off and you end up with a big chunk of cash in the bank and you live off the cash. And I know there's a lot of investors that are doing it that way, and that's cool. Um, you know, one of the guys in my office, Hayden, who's a previous client, um, great guy, works with all of our clients as well. His strategy is he's got three houses, he plans on owning his own home outright, and then he'll sell the other two for about two million bucks cash in the bank when he gets rid of them in the future, and then he's gonna put the two million bucks into the index fund in the stock market and take 80 grand of that on an average year for the rest of his life, and that's his strategy and that's cool. Um, for me personally, I mean the third strategy the accountant gave to me was keep the properties, increase the rent each year and take out, you know, 100, 150 grand of the equity and, you know, you steadily get into more debt. But as you pay off principal over time and the rents go up, it covers that difference. And I don't like that idea personally. So what we decided for me and what I've decided well before I caught up with him is I want properties owned debt free that give me, you know, 700 bucks a week to a thousand bucks a week of income that rain, hail or shine, I can live off the income from those properties and even in the worst, worst, worst financial market, 
I can always take the 700 bucks a week income down to 400 mm. and still have some form of income coming in. Mm. So when we're talking cash flow, we're talking about that fourth option, property zoned, debt free, with an income of 100, 200 grand a year passive for the rest of our lives. And mm. that's really what we're working towards. And it might not be the best return on your investment you could get in the market, but it's worked for hundreds of years and almost every single billionaire in the world or millionaire mm. is using a strategy like this to accumulate wealth. You know, people say quite frequently, as safe as houses, right? Like, you know, when you look at the different assets that you can invest in, you know, property is one of those lower risk ones because in Australia, 70% of the people that own properties are your mums and dads that live in the property. And on top of that, you know, I can't imagine we're ever going back to living in, in mud huts or, or straw huts yeah, or whatever. No. You know, people are always going to want a roof over their head. And the ABS wants to get the Australian population to 60 million people in the future. That's a huge amount of people. You know, right now we've got a significant undersupply of rental properties and, and not enough supply coming to the market either to support the 25 million people that live here right now, let alone when it, it gets to that level as well. So there's always going to be demand, there's always going to be pressure for this type of asset and, and that's why it helps us and you know I'm the exact same, like I want to get the title deed for that house, I want to own that property completely outright, I don't want to be a slave to the banks and that's just my more conservative low risk approach to investing and, and that's cool, like I think with this you really need to have a think about what you want out of life and you really need to develop a strategy that is in alignment with your goals, with your values, with your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many different ways you can do it, you know, you really need to think about how you want to do it. I love that. I think the way that I, I'm doing it at the moment is, is two-pronged approach. So when I'm talking cash flow for my own portfolio, I've got four houses with four granny flats. Now, three of them were houses that I either knocked down or bought land on, built you know, a four bedroom house on top of it with a two bedroom granny flat. And in all of those instances, the houses are giving me somewhere between about $550 and $650 per week in rent. And then the granny flats for all of those places are giving me another 320 through to about um, $650 per week, depending on which market they're in. So that strategy for me is theoretically every house and granny flat that rents for 700 bucks a week today, with a small increase of about 2.5% in the rent for the next 15 years, is gonna result in 50 grand per house and granny flat. So theoretically in my mind, I want 200 grand a year of passive income in the future there's my 200K on four properties. Mm. But on top of that, I've also got something that's a much, much higher risk strategy as I found out in COVID <laughs> because the strategy didn't work at all. No. Um, and that is um, a couple of properties that I've got um, for Airbnb. Now, I'm renovating and setting one of them up at the moment. Um, that strategy is significantly more expensive to implement, massively, massively technical but also potentially yielding a little bit higher result. Um, and what I want to talk to there as well is like, you started with the fundamentals, you started with the cornerstones, the foundations of your financial freedom. Now, the four dual income properties that you have will sustain and support you for the rest of your life. Then because you've got a lot more experience than the average investor, and because you know how to time markets extremely well and you've got a wife that's an interior designer and you've got connections in the building industry so you can do a lot of stuff for free, you are at that position where you can look at a bit more of a higher risk, potentially higher reward opportunity. But for those of you that are just getting started, it is really important to just have the foundations of your financial freedom secured before even looking into these higher risk opportunities because... That time might come in the future, um, but as you recognise through COVID, it is highly risky. And if that was your only strategy, you would have been a little bit in a, in a bad position. I would have been stuffed because in reality, this place cost me $1.1 million to create and I put down to 20% deposit. And then I've gone from assuming that I'm going to make X amount of dollars per week from Airbnb and then the booking stop. And it's like, cool, well, I've just had to chuck a tenant in for 600 bucks a week 
which $600 a week is not a significant return on that amount of money. And had I been in a worse financial position without a bit of a buffer, it could have really, really hurt me. So there's a time and a place. There's an absolute time and a place. And I suppose with you building your portfolio, yeah. exactly like same as me, the foundation will be three houses and three granny flats plus your own home. Yeah. And then from there, you might decide to renovate something every couple of years and sell it for a profit and pay the tax. You might decide to not. You might decide to do something completely different. But yeah. it's like once only once the foundation is locked in in, in place do you start poking your head up and decide yeah. if you want to do more or not. And I haven't even thought about that part yet. Like I play with different ideas just out of fun, but I have no idea and I'm just 100% laser focused on building my foundations at this point in time because I need that to ensure my financial security in the future. So capital growth, cash flow, 100% important for, for our personal strategies. Um, but probably the most important thing for me is timing, this yeah. idea of timing. Now, you hear a lot of successful investors, and I think this is true, that time in the market is more important than timing the market. So, yeah. you know, the earlier you can build your portfolio, the better. Um, but if you can use timing to your advantage, then you're going to generate stronger returns than an average investor. You know, I know people that have been waiting to time the market in Sydney since 2014 and they've missed an 80% return over that time. Mm -hmm. I talked to a friend of mine who I grew up with who's, um, we're helping him buy in Brisbane shortly, who wanted to buy down the south coast of New South Wales, like between sort of Sydney um, and, and Nowra type vibe um, four years ago. And at the time he wasn't ready. He thought the market was going to come backwards. Now that market's gone up by 70%. So the idea that we can time the market as punters when there's billion dollar businesses that spend a hundred million dollars a year on research and they can't even time it properly. Like mm. if Tesla's and Apple's and Warren Buffett's stock price is getting wiped out in COVID by 40% in three weeks. You know what I mean? Like we've got to get real about where we're actually at. And Ray Dalio talks about this with Bridgewater Associates. He says, we are the Olympians of the stock market. So you've got your 1% of the population that end up being the best athletes in the world that go and perform at the Olympics. And and they're amazing to watch. But when you're sitting on the couch watching the Olympics, you don't even think that you can compete with those guys. You just I enjoy do. it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you are, you are I just can't, beat but down. I, I think I can. <laughs> then I get ripped by like 25 metres in a 50 metre freestyle well, race. When you, when you reduce 100 metres to 40, then you, you run in the nine seconds. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but he, he considers himself the, the Olympian of the stock market and he says that like your 99% of people are going to extremely struggle to compete against that 1%. Yeah. So the illusion of timing is extraordinarily difficult. However, with real estate, because it is such a longer term asset, it is a little bit easier to time and we do have a lot of history now. Are we going to go into the 18.6 year real estate cycle? I think I we think should. I think we have to. I yeah. think we should, yeah. <laughs> you know, we talk about this a lot. We talk about Phil Anderson's cycle, WD Gann's cycle, Fred Harrison's cycle. All of these guys believe in the same thing. Um, I would highly recommend going and watching or re-watching our 18.6 year property cycle explained podcast or video, and that will help. But essentially, this cycle indicates 14 years of up, 14 years of down, Four years of down, yeah. Yeah, 14 years of up, four years of down, sorry. And this has been unfolding for over 350 years in the United Kingdom, over 250 years in the United States, and over 150 years here in Australia. Now, that's a long time. That's a hell of a lot of history to look back and learn from. And yeah. that's all we're using history to do here. So these guys didn't invent a cycle. They simply went back and observed what was going on. Yeah. And then they went, ah... And what the cycle really is, is the movement of money. Yeah. So money moves really, really tight, then really freely, then it tightens up a bit, and then it moves very freely again, and then it stops. And so effectively, if you can understand the movement of money, the way governments and institutional banks move money around and make decisions over the longer term, 
you can really get a competitive advantage. And because, as you said, 70% of the Australian housing market are non-investors, they're mm. mums and dads, 35% of them already own it outright. Mm. Um, and because it's not liquid, it's not as easy to transact. And so, you know, you might get a market where that declines by 30%, and that's happened a handful of times over the last 50 years around the world. But the likelihood of that happening regularly in the major metro markets, particularly here in Australia, is quite low. So effectively what happens is from the GFC, we go through seven years of up, we have a mid-cycle slowdown, which was COVID. We, you know, get about another five or so years up and then we have another GFC style event. Now, that's all like really cool history if you're into that stuff like we are. But in reality, imagine you're an investor that after the GFC knew that you would have had, you know, 10 to 14 years up. Mm. And so you bought a couple of assets in Sydney in 2011. Mm. Maybe you bought a, you're buying a few assets in a Brisbane or an Adelaide or a Perth now. And, you know, that is the sort of information that we can use. Now, when we overlaid the Australian thing, we found that Sydney and Melbourne normally do best, the same as your New Yorks, your Londons, your LAs, because they've got the most diversified and wealthy economies globally. Mm. They do better after a GFC. And then they get really expensive and people go, what else is around? I can't afford them anymore. Yeah. And people go to Brisbane and they go to Sunny Coast and they go to the Gold Coast and other places like that. And that's really simple because talking about part one here, capital growth, we refined it down to three markets that we like to invest in, um, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane and the surrounding regional markets. And if Sydney and Melbourne run on the same cycle, basically the 10 years out of the GFC, they perform really well historically, then you allocate your funds into those markets at the beginning of the cycle and then you know that when it gets to after the mid-cycle slowdown, historically, Brisbane has performed extremely well. And so you focus on that market, you use the growth from that. And then obviously, once a new cycle begins, you'll be ready to go back down to Sydney and Melbourne. So for me, when I'm looking at timing, I'm only ever really going to look into three markets for the rest of my life. You know, right now I'm heavily invested in Brisbane, but I'm extremely excited to use the growth from my investments in Brisbane to go purchase a property down in Sydney and or Melbourne once a new cycle begins and then continue doing this every decade for the rest of my life. And I'm not too sure how that's going to unfold. Obviously, the more experience I get, the more that I learn about this cycle, the easier it will become. Um, but look, I'm hoping to be able to almost double my money every 10 years with that strategy. You know, what's crazy about us saying that is it's based on history. Like you saying you think you can double your money, isn't you going, I hope, or I'm speculative, or we're spruiking. It's like, if you look back at the last 60 years of data, Sydney and Melbourne, for the first seven to eight years out of every GFC, you double your money. Yeah. And if you look at Brisbane in the last three cycles, you made more than 100 and 20 percent so between 2000 oh sorry 2021 and 2026 the average return based on previous cycles in Brisbane would be over 120 percent it's not like Simon and I are living up here because we're both from Sydney going we like Brisbane because it's close to where we could buy like we can buy anywhere in Australia or around the world with our business we choose to be here because we're like why the fuck isn't everyone looking at this? Like, yeah. how come they haven't looked at the 60 years worth of data? How come they're not understanding the cycle? How come they're not seeing that when vacancy rates hold below 1%, the year after's return looks about 15% up and Brisbane vacancy rates have just gone underneath that? It's like, how come people weren't expecting 40,000 people to move up? Regardless of COVID or not, they were coming up because every 15 years that happens when Sydney and Melbourne gets too expensive. It's not lucky that these things are happening. It has been happening for hundreds of years and you've just got to follow the movement of people and the movement of money to figure out what's going on. The biggest mistake that investors make when trying to time markets is they look at too small of a sample size. Yeah. Almost 100% of people that I talk with that are first, second, third or fourth time investors are looking at the 10 year average performance, which will put you in a position where you will make the wrong decision. You will buy the market that's done the best in the last 10, which means it's probably the market least likely to do the best in the next 10. Exactly. So you need to look at a longer sample size, a minimum 15 to 20 year performance. But we look at 
we look at 12 month, we look at three year, we look at 10 year, we look at 20 year, we look at 50 year, and we understand the 100 year stuff as well. So we're getting a much bigger sample size because when you look at a market like, for example, the three that we're talking about, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, if you were to just look at the 10 year performance to make your decision and you wanted to invest in the market that's performed the best over the last 10 years, then you will focus on Sydney and Melbourne because the numbers look better. But then if you go back over a 20 year period, you'll notice that Sydney and Melbourne have done extremely well, over 8% on average. Brisbane's done about 6% on average. <coughs> Sorry, that's okay. But then when you look at that, you, you go, well, from 2010 through to 2018, 19, Brisbane literally did less than inflation. So eight to 10 out of the 20 years, it did nothing. So you've really got to understand that. And then that helps you frame that decision. So you can no longer make short-term decisions based on a small sample size. You need to have a little bit of a bigger picture to understand how markets truly perform because a lot of people lose money when they purchase investment properties. And, you know, I don't know about everybody else, but I work really hard and I sacrifice a lot to build my deposits to purchase properties. I don't want to see that money go backwards. You know, it's not doing anything for me in my bank account right now, but I would certainly hate to pull it out of the bank account and then it go backwards. So making smart decisions will completely change everything. And if you can time markets a little bit better, then your journey to financial freedom will speed up. And rather than taking you 20 or 30 years to achieve that, you might be able to do it in 15 years, which is a lot shorter period of time to actually get to where you want to be. You know, there's two things that timing massively helps me with. The first is sleeping better <laughs> because there's a method to the madness. It's no one can predict the future, but you can remember the past. And you, Phil calls it remembering the future, mm. you know. And the second thing is just imagine that you bought three houses in Sydney back in 2012 knowing that Sydney to that point had been flat for the nine years before. So it had done less than 1.2% per year for nine years. Mm. It was extremely, extremely well priced again. And over that period, incomes had gone up more than 30%. So like relatively speaking, it looked as affordable as Brisbane does right yeah. now. And then you held two of those properties. Maybe you added granny flats on them. Maybe they were within 30 k's of the city and they're both worth 1.4 million each now. They're renting for over a thousand bucks a week. And last year, because you knew it was like a top, um, you know, not a top of a long-term cycle, but top it had doubled Sydney. like yeah. to the end of last year over the 10 years previously in those suburbs. And so you decided to sell that property that was worth 1.4 mil that you picked up for 700K that you only owed five on. You paid the government a shitload of tax, which is really cool for all of the stuff they provide. <laughs> And then you use that money, that million dollars cash you had after it, to completely wipe the debt on the other two properties outright. And outright. in 10 years, you've got 100 grand a year for passive income for life. You've got $2.8 million worth of property owned outright. And you have no fucks given about anything for your future, really. It's like you've got the choice to spend time with your family, to drop the kids at school, to go to the sports carnival, to holiday when you want a holiday travel when you want to travel, spend time with friends, mentor other people and show them what you've done. Like the biggest thing about leading your life by an example is you don't have to say much. You just, the results are showing up for themselves. If you're healthy, if you're happy, if you've got income coming in that you don't need because there's, instead of living in lack and fear most of the time, you'll be living in like contribution and service and that's a better place to spend your time. You know, unfortunately, finances is the biggest reason, reason why so many marriages and relationships fail. Yep. It's because some, some sort of financial situation has come up in the family that's, you know, creating that turbulence. So imagine if you didn't have to worry about money and you could spend that money and time with the people that you love the most to create a much better home environment, loving relationships, and, you know, you can actually give back and then for a lot of people that we work with, you know, they've got young kids as well. And like, imagine being able to show your kids that you've sacrificed, you've worked hard, you've made some really great decisions and you've consistently chipped away at a, a strategy for 15 years. And then you can pass that on to the kids in the future. You can pass that knowledge on to the kids in the future and they might even be able to get financially free at a younger age than you could as well. So there's that ability to create that generational wealth, to create that longer term 
financial independence for you, your family and, and, and the future generations to come. Like that is a very empowering opportunity. 100%. Like society doesn't, the market doesn't value many of the most important skill sets like teachers, artists, creatives. Like Health I've care. My, my brother-in-law is probably like the 1% of the 1% globally yeah. at art. Like he is so phenomenal. He just can't make it work because the market doesn't pay you 80 grand a year to produce. Fuck, he shits over everyone. Like the he's so good. The coolest stuff. I've got a daughter who is just so expressive and creative and the market's most likely never going to value her skill set. So it's like if you can, as a parent, like the way that I think about it is if from 18 to 30 I can help them buy a couple of great assets at the right time and sell out, they can spend their 30s like contributing, becoming yep. teachers, like doing their life's best work early enough yep to spend 20 years on that life's best stuff, you know what I mean? And go back to what it is that they're supposed to be doing. So I, I think that's so much more than the money. It's so much more than the property. If, if there was something other than property where I could use leverage as effectively to get where I wanted to be in such a short period of time, I'd be doing that. Yeah. But I'm just not a huge risk taker. And I, you know, I know there's other good assets. It's just, it's not for me. Yeah, that's fine as well. You've got to pick your lane. You can't do everything. You've got to just pick your lane but yeah you know the last thing that I want to talk about which is something that's really fun um, is manufacturing value or adding value to a property in one way or another my the reason that I love this the most is you don't have to rely on the market for that whole time mm -hmm. because as we've talked about here if you hold those properties over the long term there's likely to be some flat years and if the market isn't giving you what you want, if you've got an asset where you can add value or manufacture your own value, you don't have to rely on the market. You can take matters into your own hands, which can be fun. And these projects can be great. Now, certainly not for everyone. You do need to be a bit more of an active investor. You do need to want to get involved with that process. Um, but once again, you know, if we're just trying to generate the best return on our investment, then, you know, getting your hands dirty, getting stuck in and doing some of that work is a really good way to better your return on investment. Completely. Like a few years ago, we worked with an absolute legend named Jason. Now he won a couple of Commonwealth Games gold medals, won the um, 4x100 relay with Ian Thorpe and all those boys. Um, we tried to race him once in the ocean. <laughs> we were playing tennis all day with him and then we're like, let's have a sprint race. And he's like just <laughs> cruising like a motorboat past us. Hey? So funny. He eh? was such a great guy, but he loves getting his hands dirty. So a yeah. few years ago, we identified an undervalued pocket of the city that had only grown by 3% a year for the 10 years leading up. As you said, that university was opening up, the train was opening up. He bought this place for about 400K he went up there immediately and made it absolutely beautiful um, with his own hands over the course of about two months. And then he got that property revalued at $150,000 more straight away. That property now, from the time we bought it to what it's worth today, has gone up $350,000, including what he put into it. Um, I'd, I saw another property in another suburb recently called Cleveland that I know I could buy that property for $800,000 right now. Some guy had done the most beautiful renovation, like it was about a 500k reno. Mm. So he was in it for 1.3 and he sold it for 1,750k. Like when we're talking about manufacturing growth, whether you're just doing paints, carpets, like cosmetic makeup stuff, or you're doing something more significant there are exceptional opportunities. Like you're about to knock down a couple of places. The valuations on completion are gonna be well over a million bucks. In fact, mm. over 1.2 mil. You're probably through that process gonna pick up three or 400 grand of equity on both properties. Like that was just because you used timing, you used the capital growth play. And with those properties, the crazy thing is you'll rent the house and the granny flat out to one family the property manager said you could do it for nine fifty a week. And then based on the tax depreciation reports that we've got, you're gonna get another 200 to 300 a week for the first five years in tax benefit. Like imagine you're making 300K through manufacturing value, you're making money through timing, you're getting tax benefits. And cash and flow. And cash flow, it's like, you're gonna be getting 60 grand a year from those two properties, yeah. which is 120 
in a year's time. Like that is life changing shit. And that opportunity is available right now. Like right not, now. not at the price you bought it for, but there's an opportunity to do exactly that and make a hundred to 200 grand equity right now because the market's not pricing the shit boxes properly. And I think it's because like most people that we talk with want the nice property. Like every single time people see properties come onto the market, they immediately gravitate towards the more renovated, modern, newer dwellings because they look awesome. They look, they look good. <laughs> um, so this is what the market is, is putting more preference on. And so they're looking at those types of assets and they're getting more pressure. They're getting more people coming to the open homes, more offers. They're selling at a bit more of a premium. But then you look at these little ugly ducklings and you know, same fundamentals in terms of the location. So great value there, but just because the house hasn't been looked after or hasn't been renovated for an extended period of time, not as many people are looking at it. So you've got less competition when you're trying to purchase the property. You might be able to secure it at a better price, maybe even under market value. And then you can actually add that value yourself and get stuck in and you might be able to turn a three bed, one bathroom property into a four bedroom, two bathroom property and compete against those other ones that are, are getting all of that demand as well. And like, I've seen people, clients use that strategy where they buy the ugly duckling, they get stuck in and do a little bit of a renovation. And then immediately after that, re get it revalued, release the equity to then purchase another property as well. So you can use that strategy to speed up your accumulation phase as well. I think one of the biggest opportunities Australia wide right now, because unless you know builders that will do something for you, before, like for example, I'm putting in a pool at one of my investments at the moment. He's sold out for the next five months, but he's putting the pool in for me in three weeks because I've done pools with him before. Like yeah. I've got a guy doing a deck and a kitchen for me. They're like timeline right now is six months. They did it for me in the first literally three days. Like it's because if you don't have that relationship in the current market, it's really hard. And what's gonna happen is people have the shits with tradies right now because the prices have gone through the roof. And I was having an event about this. My sister said, well, my husband's a carpenter. His petrol has gone from 200 a week to 600 a week right now. And mm. so he's having to pass that cost on to every single person. Mm. And I was like, I feel for where it's at, but because they haven't been delivering, because there's not enough of them, because the price have gone through the roof and because of the supply issues, the whole of Australia is going to get a hugely poor taste in their mouth around building and renovating. And the whole market is going exactly where you said, towards quality places. Yep. These knockdowns that should be selling for 100 or 200 grand more, because nobody wants to touch them right now, are so under market value, particularly in parts of Brizzy, mm -hmm. relative to what they could be worth, and these renovators too. Like the next 18 months, the 24 months until they figure out this global supply issue and we get another you know, 500,000 tradesmen in, hopefully in the country, it sounds like what we need right now. You know, there is this, in and as a business, we're just constantly following Moving. the market and looking for that opportunity as to like, manufacturing growth was not an option for the last two and a half years. You could not make money from doing something because the market was pricing it. All of a sudden, that's hard. There's this huge value gap and opportunity and it's exciting. It's exciting for those people like us that want to look outside the box. And by the way, like eight out of 10 clients, maybe nine, don't even want to talk about manufacturing. No. Value. They like want a place that's livable and in 15 years they'll clean it up before they sell it. Yeah. But for those clients that want to be more active, man, the knockdown dual lock opportunity at the moment on the beaches of Brisbane is phenomenal. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? Because like in parts of Brisbane right now, like the, the government won't allow you to rent it out separately, but talking to our property managers, with rents increasing so rapidly at the moment and with property prices increasing so rapidly, there is a huge portion of the market that has grandma, grandpa, mum, dad and kids living under the one roof because that's the only or the most financially viable situation for them. Um, or you're getting like people, like two families coming together to rent out a property because they can't afford to do it themselves. And like, this is an unfortunate reality for people that rent, um, but it's a huge opportunity for property investors to, you know, look at that. And, and then it also, you, you're sort of getting two birds with one stone there because you're manufacturing the value, but you're also 
allowing that family a better living option than, than the alternative as well. So you're kind of helping them out in one way as well. So, you know, there's just such a really cool opportunity there to kind of look at these unique projects and start manufacturing your own value. And, you know, for, for everybody that can do that, it's just going to make that process a lot less stressful because if you can get some short-term returns, it just feels a lot better and it gives you a lot more motivation to continue on that journey. For sure, like on one of my properties at the moment on the North Brisbane beaches, I'm renting out to one family, a four bedroom house with a two bedroom granny flat, I think for 9.65 a week <laughs> or something. And there's four income earners in that family earning a combined income of 300K per year. Do you know how like good that makes me feel? Like the rent that I'm charging them is such a small percentage of their overall income, mm. two or three of the people could lose their, their jobs in that home, which isn't gonna happen because unemployment's at the lowest rate in 50 years. And I could still get my rent. Like it's also safety as you start to do some of these strategies too. So I think capital growth, cash flow, timing, adding some value or manufacturing some value, they're the things that we try and hit as professional investors that do this every day. Yep. Not everyone is interested in this. Like we talk to this strategy all the time and have been doing so for six and a half, seven years now. A lot of our clients are like, I just want a great blue chip place close to the city or on the beach, or I just want this super affordable 400 to 500K option in one of the fringe suburbs that hasn't yet gone off with great cash flow in and, in and of itself. And the cool thing about your Brizzies, your Adelaides and your, your Perths is because they haven't gone through the roof and because rents and wages have gone up, you know, you can almost get cash flow neutral on a 20% cash deposit mm. and a 4% interest rate right now. And that's exciting for people too, to be holding properties without like freaking out every single year about the holding costs. Yeah. And that that's fine to have a strategy where you're, you know, maybe just using two or three of these things, maybe not all four of them, um, because there's a time and a place, you know, everybody's busy. You know, a lot of people are working 40 to 60 hours per week and may not have the time or the skills to do this, especially as an interstate investor. So, you know, to each is, is their own, but you just need to think outside the box. And it's just like, if you are wanting to just go a little bit more conservative, then you just got to understand there might be, you might not get as much growth as you would ideally want. And, you know, just come to terms with that fact um, because you may not be willing to put in that extra work or go that extra mile, which is fine as long as you're in it for the longer term and, and you're comfortable with the strategy that you're implementing. For sure. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you for all of you guys that are still listening to this today. And I'd like to offer you a one-on-one -on -one strategy session with either myself or my brother Simon. All you have to do is jump over to the website www.pumpedonproperty.com, click that free strategy session button, Find a time that works for you in the next couple of weeks. Those sessions are, now that confidence is back in the market, getting filled extremely quickly again. Um, and in that session, we can talk about where you are, where you wanna be longer term. We can educate you on the market and a few of these different ideas. And then you can go and smash it on your own, or maybe we can decide um, together if you wanna become one of the small number of clients we work with each month, and we can help you execute a simple strategy or a more complicated strategy depending on your risk profile, your short and longer term goals. But either way, I do suggest you checking out the website because finally, after you. seven years um, or six years, we're going through a rebrand at the moment. Um, we're working with the incredible designer that does all the stuff for the three birds and a whole lot of Australia's other best brands um, over at Pepper Heart. It's gonna look sick. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Like I haven't even looked at the copy on the website, honestly, for six <laughs> years, six and a half years. It doesn't sound or look like us. So finally, it's gonna be like absolute world-class and I'm super excited to be like doing something that's gonna make the experience for you guys so much better as well. Support us and give us a, fluke, a few clicks. <laughs> Cheers. Have a good one. Woo, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Getting Have a cool, spin. Bro. Yeah. Sweaty, so sweaty. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's so nice, eh? Oh.